Welcome back. Today we're talking about elections, and we're talking about two essays, number 38 and 40, Susan B. Anthony's uh, expansion of this concept of we the people to women, and then Joe McGinnis's selling candidates as products. So in the tradition of Thurgood Marshall, in the tradition of um, Frederick Douglass, we have Susan B. Anthony on page 208 talking in terms of what again do you mean by this idea of we the people? And what's interesting about her argument, similar to Thurgood Marshall's argument, is that they use the Constitution and they use the concepts that we've talked about before in the legal basis of equality under the law as the real evidence and the real core of their argument, of her argument. And so, again, we're talking about um, 1873, right after uh, the Civil War. Frederick Douglass was a proponent of equality for gender and the question of who has the right to vote. Now, again, from a historical point of view, the real emphasis of the uh, women's suffrage movement came uh, due to the sociological uh, events uh, surrounding World War I. But um, this was before that, and also her argument rings particularly true in the case of the American political system. So she starts, friends and fellow citizens, I stand before you tonight under indictment for the alleged crime of having voted at the last presidential election without having a lawful right to do so. It shall be my work this evening to prove to you that in thus voting, I not only committed no crime, but instead simply exercised my citizens' rights guaranteed to me and all the United States citizens by the national constitution beyond the power of any state to deny. Again, she's using language from the constitution. She starts with the preamble. And we all know the preamble since we've read it several times, but I just want to repeat that. We the people of the United States in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. As we have talked about, and now she uses in her argument, this language does not identify any gender or race or ethnic background when we're talking about citizens of the United States. It was we, the people, not we, the white male citizens, nor yet we, the male citizens, but we, the whole people who formed the union. And we formed it not to give the blessings of liberty, but to secure them, not to the half of ourselves and the half of our posterity, but to the whole people, women as well as men. And it is downright mockery to talk to women of their enjoyment of the blessings of liberty while they are denied the use of the only means of securing them provided by this democratic Republican government, the ballot. So what's really interesting, I think, is how if we didn't have the Constitution, this idea of we the people could not be measured. But because it's in the Constitution, because we have a Constitution that, as we've talked about, is both a political document and a legal document, we have a criteria. And the criteria, and she's perfectly correct, right? It doesn't say half, it doesn't say all the men, it doesn't say all the women, it doesn't say all the whatever, right? As Thurgood Marshall says, this concept of we the people has been expanding and expanding and expanding. And it doesn't make a difference. And this is where, again, people really don't understand or people really don't want to understand the importance and the fragility of our system because it doesn't matter what the person thought when they were writing this preamble. What matters is how those words are interpreted. And we have a criteria in which we can measure 
that. And it's not subjective. What does we the people mean? Right? What does we the people mean? And this is the basis of not only popular sovereignty, but it's the basis, again, of what we see as being human, what we see as being a person. And this is a very, very uh, important insight, important concept. Because the people who want to get rid of the Constitution, or the people who want to uh, burn the system, or the people who say the law is the problem, they are ignoring or they are forgetting the point that if you don't have the objective criteria, if it's just a subjective criteria of an in-group versus the out-group, a majority versus a minority, or minority versus a majority, then what happens is whatever the wind blows is what's going to be considered uh, right or legal. She goes on, for any state to make sex a qualification of the must ever result in the dis disenfranchisement of an entire half of the person to pass a bill of attainder or an ex post facto law and is therefore a violation of the supreme law of the land. By its blessings of liberty, we are forever withheld from women and their female posterity. To them, this government has no just powers derived from the consent of the governed. To them, this government is not a democracy, it is not a republic. It is an odious aristocracy, a hateful oligarchy of sex, the most hateful aristocracy ever established on the face of the globe. An oligarchy of wealth, where the rich govern the poor, an oligarchy of learning, where the educated govern the ignorant, or even an oligarchy of race, where the Saxon rules the African, might be endured. But this oligarchy of sex, which makes fathers, brothers, husbands, and sons, the oligarchs over mothers, sisters, wives, and daughters of every household, which ordains all men sovereign, all women subjects, carries a dimension, discord, and rebellion into every home of the nation. Western, Webster, Worcester, and Bouvier all define a citizen to be a person in the United States entitled to vote and hold office. The only question left to be settled now is, are women persons? Again, this is the same argument that Frederick Douglass brings about our slaves persons. And I hardly believe any of our opponents will have the hardihood to say that they are not. Being persons then, women are citizens and no state has a right to make any law or to enforce any old law that shall abridge their privileges or immunities. Hence, every discrimination against women in the Constitution and the laws of several states is today null and void, precisely as is everyone against Negroes. So again, she is using the principles of our society, the principles that define our nationhood, popular sovereignty, rule of law, and tolerance. And she's saying, why am I not included in that? If a citizen, right, and she defines a citizen, if a citizen is defined as the action of voting and holding office, and I am a citizen, but I'm precluded from doing that, it is unconstitutional, and the laws are null and void. Now, of course, Susan B. Anthony's problem or issue is that she is not the person to determine what is constitutional and what is not. The Supreme Court is. And of course, by 1920, they had to change the Constitution to make sure that women do get the vote. So we start again with this idea of who is a person and who gets the vote. Now, in the, when we discuss this and when we talk about citizenship, as we've said, the United States and its citizenship is unique because it does not come from the traditional ideas of nation. American citizenship, and if you know, if you had people or you know people who've become American citizens from other systems, from other countries, from other nations, you know that 
It is a legal status. Citizenship and the right to vote and hold office is a piece of paper. And then again, when you hear people talking about anchor babies or you hear people talking about getting rid of this uh, birth requirement for citizenship, my question to them is, what else would you use? And again, going back to Susan B. Anthony, do you want to have an oligarchy based on wealth? Do you want to have an oligarchy based on education? Do you want to have an oligarchy based on race? Do you want to have an oligarchy based on gender? No, of course not. Birth is a fact. The old saying, maternity is a fact. That's why some cultures use the mother's identification as the test of whether you're part of the community or not, not the father's. Paternity is a belief. Maternity is a fact. And so we go, again, without the Constitution, you do not have these, this argument by Susan B. Anthony. Without the Constitution, you do not have the American nation as we know it. Instead, you have this different, uh, the term has been used as tribes or collectives or whatever, but it's not part of that American nation that's spelled out in the Constitution. And what's great about Susan B. Anthony in the speech is that she uses that. She uses not the perception of women of the Founding Fathers, not even perception of women of her own generation in 1873, but she uses the words of normal vernacular, of normal language. What does we the people mean? And if, I, and if I'm part of this American nation, then I have to have all of the privileges and all of the immunities, not just some of them. And we see how important it is that we have rule of law. She's not saying people should consider their opinions about equality between the genders. She's not saying that, is she? What is she saying? She's saying, we the people, the language of the Constitution, demands that I have the right to vote because of the rule of law. In your heart, in your mind, in your consciousness, whatever you want to call it, if you don't see us as being equal, hey, doesn't matter. What matters is, the law says I'm equal. The Constitution says I'm equal. And again, going back to Frederick Douglass's art, uh, language, when, Doug, when Douglass says, if you can't see this inherent truth, you are either so prejudiced in your heart or you are a slaveholder. And the same can be said for Susan B. Anthony's argument. If you can't see, and she says, right, am I a person, right, are women people, when women are people, then none of us are people because we all have come from a, a woman, right? So again, I'm highlighting this essay due to the argument and due to this concept of equality under the law. You're gonna, you don't get equality any, with any other technique. You don't get equality with religion. You don't get equality with other sociological techniques. You don't get eco uh, equality with economic techniques. You get it only through this idea of equality of law, of the equality of the process that people have to live under. All right. So again, pay particular attention to that essay because uh, her argument is um, strengthens strengthens faith in this idea of rule of law and of voting. And again, we live in a time where the civil rights movement was based on voting registration. We've expanded the franchise to everyone who's over 18. And that's why maybe people don't value it. Again, only half of us who are eligible to vote, vote. And that's on the presidential elections, on the mundane and, and uh, lower level elections it might be 20%. So, again, giving some context. 
As we move now to Joe McGinnis's selling candidates as products, one of the things that's really interesting about McGinnis, and this is written in 68, and if you've seen now the making of the president in 1968, you saw what a tumultuous year that was. But the thing about McGinnis and the thing about this essay, which, is, which I think is very interesting, is we know, as I said last time, is that it didn't start with Nixon. Right, it really started at 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 the foremost of using television and sell, using advertising techniques to get candidates elected. It started with John F. Kennedy, and there's a very famous story about Tip O'Neill, who was this, later became Speaker of the House, but he's a congressman from from Massachusetts, from the Boston area, and he basically uh, took over the seat that John F. Kennedy won in '48, but then gave up uh, to become a senator in 1950. I'm sorry, 1952. So um, Lyndon Lynn, Johnson is, as you know, running for the presidency unofficially in 1960. And he comes to Tip O'Neill and says, uh, I want you to, I want, I'm counting on your support. And Tip O'Neill says, you're going to lose to Kennedy. And Johnson starts the way Johnson talks and the way he was, right? Listing all of these different reasons and all of these different things that John F. Kennedy didn't have and didn't do and all these things that Lyndon Johnson did. And, and Tip O'Neill says, basically, the Kennedys are going to bring techniques that no one has seen. And what they did was very, very smart. So as with Susan B. Anthony saying that women are women equal, Kennedy, one of his techniques was to, at this time in our economy, there were a lot of women who were at home. There were a lot of women who, because of the baby boom, had infants and little kids. There were a lot of uh, people, if you've seen uh, period television shows like Mad Men and this kind of thing, right? There was a very strict, um, social position for women. And so the Kennedys ran advertisements during the day. And the Kennedys understood if you get the women to uh, volunteer and be engaged in your campaign, then the husbands will follow. And so they had commercials, they had products, they had things called Kennedy's Teas where you would have uh, um, meetings of you get to meet the senator's sisters and wife and and coffee clutches and these kind of things which was a big deal and we're talking about the 1950s and 19, early 1960s so Kennedy really starts this and as again uh, forgive me for repeating myself but Nixon in the debate and Johnson in the convention and Humphrey and all these other people are in the primaries they just get steamrolled. They just get, they just, they don't know what to do because this is such a new campaign technique. But one thing you can say, one thing you can say about Nixon is he learned. So Nixon doesn't run in 1964, but he runs in 1968. And what is Nixon's biggest challenge? Nixon's biggest challenge is that, again, a little brief history. So Nixon is VP from 1952 to 1960. He loses the presidency and he tries to be uh, a good sport about it. He tries to be a good loser and doesn't get him very much. But in 1962, he tries to run for governor of California and he loses. And this is the famous press conference he has. And he basically says, well, you're pretty lucky because you won't have Dick Nixon to kick around anymore. And he basically says, I'm leaving politics. When John Kennedy saw that, he said, he's dead. He's politically dead. Okay, now think about this. Nixon is politically dead in 1963. And five years later, he wins the presidency. Five years later, he wins the presidency. And so how does he do it? Well, one of these things, as again, we may have mentioned 
Nixon used to do these really strange, uh, say these really strange things and then sort of hold to them. His campaign speech about, I'm going to campaign in 50 states. Well, he ended up, what happened in 1960? The last weekend of the campaign, he's in Alaska. And Kennedy's in New York. Or he'll say, men don't wear makeup in the debate. Well, yes, they do. And so he starts learning this stuff, right? He starts, he starts saying, okay, I'm going to have to start doing some of these techniques that Kennedy talked about. Well, McGinnis doesn't, McGinnis doesn't talk about these things, right? McGinnis's premise is that somehow Nixon is the one who's, and his words, a con man. And he says this in the very first sentence on page 213, essay number 40. Politics, in a sense, has always been a con game. Okay? Politics, in a sense, has always been a con game. Why? And he goes on. The American voter insisting upon his belief in a higher order clings to his religion, which promises another better life and defends passionately the illusion that the men he chooses to lead him are of finer nature than he. So the first thing he's saying is that we vote and we vote for people who we want to be better than us. Okay. I would contend that's half true. Why wasn't Nelson Rockefeller ever elected president? Remember, again, in the film, they say, He's, is he too rich? Or why are other, like Harry Truman, who was, he, he was, he was uh, victorious in his 1948 election, but people said and criticized him for not being of a higher wealthier or higher uh, level in society. Matter of fact, I'm surprised they haven't started um, pulling down Truman statues because he used the N-word, uh, which was, uh, in, in his day, again, used fairly commonly. But Truman was an everyday man, right? Truman was a person who wasn't, doesn't fit this bill that McGinnis starts with his essay. Roosevelt was. Right? And so we look at it, we look at our leaders, do we vote for them because they're better than we are? Or do we vote for them because we hope they're like us, but they're just smarter, better, better looking, had more opportunities, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? That is an answer that's not fully answered, but is that a con? Am I am I remember remember again, Littman talks in terms of we have fictions in our in our pseudo-environment but they're not lies. So is it a con? I don't know. I wish he would, if he's using everyday language, I would say somebody who says, I'd like to be president of the United States, on its face is sort of a delusional aspiration, but is it a con? I don't know. I don't think so. Potential presidents are measured against an ideal that is a combination of the leading man, God, Father, Hero, Pope, King, and maybe just a touch of the avenging furies thrown in. And people, again, will say this about Trump, right? People will say, he's not acting presidential. Well, what does that mean? He's not acting presidential. He's not acting like George Washington. He's not acting like Abraham Lincoln. He's not acting like a mature adult. He's emotional. He's counterpunching. He's twittering, whatever. Well, yes, that's what he's doing. Is that presidential? It might be today, right? There might be a new era. Do we look at a person like Trump or Obama or Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden? Do we look at these people as a god, a father, a hero, a pope, a king? I, I don't, you'd have to answer that for yourself. But me personally, I do not. I would like a little confidence. I'd like a little experience. I'd like a little, right? I'd like a little perspective. Do those people have that? I don't know. How do I know? How do you know? We don't know, right? We're dealing with our perceptions of these people. And McGinnis is talking about, we're looking for some hero. We think that the White House should have and house people that are 
uh, that never sin, that never have a problem, that their families are, are perfect and they are perfect. And so that's what our reporting is concentrating on, right? Our reporting concentrates on uh, Trump's kids or Biden's kids or their relationship or all of these very superficial things. He goes on, an advisor to Richard Nixon wrote in a memorandum late in 1967, then perhaps aware that Nixon qualified only as father, he discussed the improvements that we would have to be made, not upon Nixon himself, but upon the image of him that was received by the voter. Oh, so the image doesn't sit right with the person. Again, you can't, you, can you have it both ways? People talked about how John Kennedy was an incredible cheater on his wife, and they sort of they sort of see that's they're sort of proud of that. And then you have these politicians, Bill Clinton, Donald Trump, and there's some stories now about Biden, right? And and these people now again, I don't know if they're true or not, but if the practice is despicable, it has to be considered despicable amongst everybody, not for the, just the people that I don't like the politics I don't like, the ideology I don't follow. And we don't have that in this, right? We don't have this in, in our discussion. We don't have people saying, I'm not going to vote for this candidate because of this personal practice, this personal behavior. But I will not vote against my opponent because I disagree with him anyway, and now I'm morally outraged. And you can, it's politics, and it's Hollywood, it's every, it's all of these areas. We are not objective. We are subjective, and we are not even, we don't even wait for evidence. But again, McGinnis is saying somehow we are victims or we are uh, thoughtless robots or naive little children, and we can't see this. Because he goes on and says, advertising in many ways is a con game too. Who says, right? Human beings do not need new automobiles every third year. Who says that, right? If I could afford a new car every third year, why wouldn't I have one? A color television set brings little enrichment of the human experience. Not if you don't have one. Try, right? I love these people who say, I hate my television, right? They're usually bumper stickers. I hate my, and then you ask them, well, what do you, you don't watch any television at all? Well, I watch f football or I watch PBS or I watch, right? It's, or they watch through their computer or what now streaming. But the, my point is maybe a person wants to work and maybe a person wants to have a new color television set. Or maybe a person is, that brings that person a lot of joy. Who are we to say that advertising is a con game? It gives the individual no choice, right? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I was watching TV and I saw the hose that you turn the water off and it pulls itself together. And then when you turn the water on, it shoots up and I buy it. Am I being just a robot or do I really want a hose that does those things? Or the Arctic hat, right? This new commercial that says the Arctic hat. And that's the funny thing about these infomercials because their setup and their structure is so interesting, right? Because they have whatever product they're doing and the person's life is miserable. And usually they have this sound, wah, wah, right? So, oh, it can't bake an egg, right? He can't fry an egg. Look at poor John, he can't open the egg. He can't crack. Oh, there's shells, oh, wah, wah. What, he sh what should he do? Oh, he should buy the eggomatic. This eggomatic. Shells the egg, you put it in the microwave, you get beautiful omelets, beautiful waffle, whatever. And McGinnis would say that we can't decide that that's what we want or what we don't want. We automatically go into that. Well, maybe he's right, because when you watch TV, they're on every other commercial. But I would contend that it's not a con game. They're not hiding anything from you, right? The, the bottom line is... If you think, again, going back to our criteria of independence of action, if I think that buying the Arctic hat, which will make me 20 degrees uh, cooler when I work on my garden, 
then I want I want to work in my garden when it's 100 degrees. Uh, is that a con game? Or maybe I just like it. Maybe I just want it. Maybe I want a new car every third year. Maybe I want a color television. But he's saying it's not going to bring me an enrichment in my life. How many color televisions does he have? And a higher or lower hemline. No expansion of consciousness and no increase in the capacity to love. Who knows? Right? Who knows? If I'm a woman and I want to be in fashion and I want, is that, that might be very important to me. Or if I'm, a, if I'm a gentleman and I want to be in fashion, that might be very important to me. Who's beginning to say that it's a con game? Because I always, this is the point that I'm trying to make. Individuals always have the power to turn it off. Individuals always have the power to say no. I'm not going to buy that. I'm not going to purchase that. That's why hit television shows or marketing programs, if you're studying marketing, you know this, that there is not one set of techniques that works every time. They don't really know. You have to, you have to experiment. It's chemistry. Sometimes you, get, you catch lightning in a bottle. Sometimes you don't. But in McGinnis's perspective, his premise is that people are fools, right? People succumb to con games of politics, and they succumb to the con game of advertising. He goes on, it is not surprising then that politicians and advertising men should have discovered one another. And once they recognized that the citizen did not so much vote for the candidate as make a psychological purchase of him, not surprisingly, that they began to work together. Again, very blatantly in the Kennedy campaign in 1960. In the last half century, we have misled ourselves about men, about how greatness can be found among them. We have become so accustomed to our illusions that we mistake them for reality. This is Bornstein again, and this should be familiar to you. We demand them, and we demand that they be always more of them, bigger, better, and more vivid. The presidency seems the ultimate extension of our error. Right? He's talking about the pseudo event and voting. <clears throat> so he goes on, McGinnis goes on and talks in terms of this idea of uh, marketing or uh, creating uh, an image that is not accurate to the person. Price suggested attacking prices his was uh, Nixon's press secretary and media advisor. Price suggested attacking the personal factors rather than the historical factors, which were the basis of the low opinion so many people had of Richard Nixon. These tend to be more of a gut reaction, Price wrote unarticulated, non-analytical, a product of a particular chemistry between the voter and the image of the candidate. We have to be very clear on this point, that the response to his image, not the man, is not what there's that counts. It's what's projected. And carrying it one step further, it's not what he projects, but rather what the voter receives. It is not the man we have to change, but rather the received impression. And this impression often depends more on the medium and its use than it does on the candidate himself. So there you would have to be the new Nixon, simply a new approach to television. Okay, so McGinnis is basically criticizing Nixon for learning from his defeats. Learning. Now again, I'm not a Nixon fan, but when you, I'm trying to show you the argument and the premise that is involved in this essay. They said the same thing about Reagan. Oh, how could you ever, how could you ever uh, vote for a actor? Well, the famous line of Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, <clears throat> said to an actor, you and, I are the, are, you and I are the two best actors uh, in the country. Of course, Roosevelt was an actor. Of course, Roosevelt used radio and the fireside chat. Was that a con game? Oh, no, I like Roosevelt, therefore it's not a kind game. Well, it doesn't work that way, right? And that's the problem. Is leadership a con game? If I, if I, I mean, do you want, Jimmy Carter famously said, and I'll, we'll talk about this a little bit about the presidency, but Jimmy Carter said, I'll never lie to the, I'll never lie to the people. 
well, maybe you want, I mean, do you really want to be exposed to some of the problems that we have? Right? Would you want the president to come in and say, oh, my God. Oh, geez. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. That Putin, he's a pretty smart cookie. He's got me zigging when I'm supposed to be zagging, and he's got me zagging when I'm supposed to be zigging. And that president, she, whoa! Wow, he's outdone me. Huh! I don't know what the heck I'm doing. And geez, I don't know. Inflation, infrastructure, I don't know. I don't know. I guess I'm not, I'm just not, I'm just not qualified for this job. I'm just in over my head. I don't know. But eh, I said I'd never lie to you. No, of course not. And if you compare, you can go on YouTube and compare images of Jimmy Carter with Ronald Reagan. And Reagan understood this idea of leadership by optimism. So did Eisenhower. People, you know, Eisenhower was not necessarily a nice guy, a jovial guy. People talked about his temper. But what did he do? He projected an image of success. Is that a con game? When you go to an interview for a job that you want to have, do you say, you really don't want to hire me, do you? Or do you say, I really want this job and I'll really work hard and I'll be there on time and I'll do all these other things. Are you counting that person who believes you and who hires you? Well, if you don't do the job, I guess you are. But no, you're not. You are putting your best, we would say, you're putting your best foot forward. You are making an image that, is it you? Well, we're talking about, you know, never lie, but we're talking about putting your foot, your best foot forward. And so, again, this is his perspective. This is his argument. And he's saying, basically, Nixon won in 1969, and it was a con. But wait a minute, right? Wait a minute. You now have seen the making of the president in 1960, and you've seen the making of the president in 1968, and this week, I, I've assigned with this unit the making of the president in 1964. And what has happened, right? What has happened? Was the country, during the 1960s, was the country better off? Or the people felt the perception that they were better off? The reason why Nixon won, I would contend, the reason why Nixon won in 1968 was several reasons. There were several assassinations, right? Also, what happened? Well, the Democrats, they split apart. They split in half. And you have, or they split in actually three sections, right? For the Democratic Party, you have the little Wallace, right? The segregationists of the South. Wallace was a Democratic governor of Alabama, and he runs in the South. You have Humphrey, who did not run in any primaries. Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Eugene McCarthy. It was Kennedy McCarthy. That was the race. And what happened was Kennedy was assassinated. McCarthy didn't have the support of the convention and they nominated Hubert Humphrey, the sitting vice president. And then you have Nixon. Now again, are you telling me that if you if you wouldn't have had Wallace, if you wouldn't have, if you had a different candidate than Humphrey, that Nixon would have won? I find that highly doubtful. But that's speculation. We don't know. But McGinnis, he's basically saying Nixon won because it was a con. And this is when I reverted back to 2016 when we talked about that. When I said when Mrs. Clinton did not admit her defeat. That was a very big mistake on the part of the Democrats. And the same is true with McGinnis and Humphrey. It was a close race. Humphrey lost. When you insult the voter, when you say to the voter that somehow, when you, we all know the rules of the game, and you say, oh, those rules are different or wrong or whatever, that's a problem. That's a problem of perspective, right? That's a problem of, is that a con? 
So he goes on, and this worked, right? They could do this and succeeded because of the special nature of the man. Now he's going to criticize Nixon's personality, right? There's something sinister about Nixon. Was there something sinister about Kennedy, John Kennedy? Was there something sinister about Eisenhower? There was apparently something in Richard Nixon's character which sought this shelter, something which craved regulation, which flourished the best in the darkness behind cliches, behind the phalanxes of antiseptic advisors, some part of him that could breathe freely only inside a hotel suite that cost $100 a day. Again, Robert Kennedy didn't use media people, right? Eugene McCarthy, when you saw on the film in the night, Making the President 1968, and he's playing, swinging ba the baseball bat, and he's on the, he's on the uh, jet plane, and they talk about um, he's some kind of poet scholar. That wasn't a con. And it worked. As he moved serenely through the primary campaign, there was a new cadence to Richard Nixon's speech and motion, new confidence in his heart, and a new image of him on the television screen. TV both reflected and contributed to his strength. Because he was winning, he looked like a winner on screen. Because he was suddenly projecting well on the medium he had feared, he went about his other tasks with assurance. The one fed upon the other, building to an astonishing peak in August as the Republican convention began, and he emerged from his regal isolation, traveling to Miami, not so much to be nominated as coronated. Now again, you saw the film, you know what happened in Chicago in 1968 with the Democrats, and the Republicans had a calm convention. If you're the voter and you're asking yourself, which party can run the government, and the Democrats have been in control since 1960, and you have problems with ur urban and race, you have problems with Vietnam, you have problems with drugs, what would be your conclusion? Your conclusion may be, maybe we should give the other guys a chance. Are you being conned? He was nominated as, or as on live but controlled television. Now, again, what is an election? If we talk about what is an election, remember our definition of party, right? Activists. Organized to win, and it would be it would it would be as if when LeBron James comes to L.A. and people say, "Oh, you can't come, you can't play." When people say, "Well, why is he here?" Well, he really, that's a con game. He really should be in Cleveland. Why? It's not fair. You hear this term all the time, fair. What is fair? Right? What is fair? If I have an innovation, like John Kennedy did in 1960, his campaign, he's not going to wait his turn. It was Lyndon Johnson's turn. What did Kennedy do, though? What did he have to think about? What did he have to innovate? He had to figure out a way to get the nomination without a person like Lyndon Johnson's support. And then once he got the nomination, he brought Johnson on the ticket. Why? Because Johnson's job was to win the South. And ultimately he did. So when a candidate you like innovates, that's okay. But when the candidate you don't like innovates, then somehow it's crooked. Donald Trump gained his nomination by free media. People like uh, Joe Scarborough and television shows like that gave him so much free media, uh, media because they wanted him to be the nominee. And, and Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, when he dropped out of the presidential race, said to the other members of, this, of his fellow candidates, Everyone needs, we need to find one guy to consolidate and one person to go head to head with Donald Trump or Trump's going to win the nomination. That was Trump's innovation. Trump used Twitter. He used cable television news. He used all of these free devices. And so 
Is that a con game? No, everyone's every all of his opponents were upset when he when he won. But again, Mrs. Clinton never went to Wisconsin. So is it Trump? Is it Trump's fault that that campaign was incompetent? Oh, it's the Electoral College. It's unfair. No, your candidate wasn't very good, and the campaign wasn't very good. The same can be told about Mitt Romney's campaign against Barack Obama or John McCain's campaign against uh, Barack Obama. Why? Because they didn't win. When you don't win, it doesn't matter what you did. Because the activists look, and they winning is what counts. Again, that's why we have our definitions that we talked about. So understanding what this, you know, making a story of a good guy versus a bad guy that both McGinnis does and the following uh, essay that's assigned they do, that makes good journalism and makes it an interesting story, but it is not objective analysis. And so, again, was the Electoral College uh, bad when uh, Barack Obama was elected? Or is it only bad that when Trump gets elected? And this is the, this is the question that people don't want to, they don't want to be objective. They don't want to step aside and they don't want to say, well, wait a minute. Do we sell, do we sell candidates as products? Sure we do. Yes, we do. And we sell products as products. We are a capitalistic country. We honor people who are successful, right? We have a classification of people called billionaires. And we tend to, I mean, why do we listen to athletes? And why do we listen to actors? And why do we listen to celebrities when they have no basic training in the thing that they're commenting on, such as vaccines, as I mentioned before? because they must have something on the ball because they are selling themselves as a product, right? So my point is that when people come to you and try to give you an explanation of why they lost the election and it wasn't the voter rejecting both their ideas and their person, hold your wallet because it's usually not an, it's usually not a accurate or uh, precise analytical observation because the same is when your team loses as i mentioned before when your team loses a game oh the ref stole it from us no you lost the objective of the game was to score whatever game it was more points more points than your opponent the objective in running for president is to have more electoral college votes than your opponent. The popular vote doesn't matter. The popular vote doesn't matter. And so when people say, well, the system's unfair, okay, reform the system. We have a process for that called amending the Constitution. But I tell you, a lot of people in South Dakota are not not going to be very favorable of losing their electoral college votes. And people in California and New York can't always just demand things. And so, again, when we have an election, when we have politics, when we have candidates, when we have these things, ask yourself, right? Ask yourself, how are they going to win? How do they reach that magic number in the Electoral College? And that is one thing that, going back to the previous discussion, that's one thing that political bosses really understood and again when you saw kennedy trying to deal with these governors and these bosses they were very reluctant because they didn't think he could win because he was a catholic and because he basically hadn't done anything in the senate they didn't think lyndon johnson could win either because lyndon johnson was a southerner and a southerner had not been elected since the civil war and would not be elected uh, of course, Johnson was elected, but a lot of that was the Kennedy and the assassination. A, a, a Southerner on their own was not elected to the presidency until 1976, Jimmy Carter. 
and then Bill Clinton was elected in 92. So again, we, we approach the political parties and we approach the elections from the, stand, from the point of view of using these essays, using what actually happened in, his, in historical context and trying to digest and understand using scientific method. Until next time, be safe.